Hey there. Thanks for tuning in. You ready for another episode of my Bigfoot sighting? All right then. Let's do this. Seen a bunch of run-down new horse towns where the church is the backbone, loves in the bow. And the five-string melodies groove in. With the farmland rows where the roots run deep. Beyond the noise of the busy streets. Where the songs of the south are soothing. When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out. I don't run from banjo music. Yeah. My Bigfoot sightings have changed and led me on a wild and wonderful adventure. It all started about uh, probably about 10, 11 years ago when uh, four of my friends and myself just decided we were going to go down to an area in Ohio called Hawking Hills. Now, they've all gone down there before. I've never been there, but these are the people that yeah, I traveled the northwestern United States with looking for ghosts and goblins and witches and demons all over the place. And they told me we'd go down there and take a break and go hiking because Hawking Hills is a beautiful area for you know, they have caves and waterfalls and trails and you name it. I mean, it is just fantastic. I mean, they have them where it's easy for like a handicap accessible trail where people can go in there and they go to this cave and you can still see a waterfall to People that want to go out and go hiking for a week to two weeks. So it's like, yeah, let's try getting out of these old, dungy, musty buildings for a while and try something out in uh, the wildlife. So I agreed and we went down there. And Friday, we get down there, we're unloading the car and taking everything into this cabin, which was turns out to be a two story house with a fully furnished basement with a seven person hot tub. Yeah, we were really going to rough it for this weekend. So when we got outside, after we loaded everything, we started cooking dinner and starting to bonfire up. This stray beagle comes up to us. And we're like, okay, this little beagle is friendlier than heck. And it had a collar on it, but there's no dog tags or anything. And you can tell this dog's been out and abandoned for quite a while because it was pretty mangy looking. I mean, you can tell it was, it's been seen its worst. So we took it in and we fed it. And you know, it became you know, it was like it was our pet. It was hung out with us and everything. So nothing eventful happened Friday night. We get to bed early. We get up Saturday morning and out we go. We drive down to Hawking Hills and we start doing all the hiking up and down cliffs and in the caves and checking out the waterfalls. And the one guy with who, uh, Jamie, who tells everyone he's really, really shy, decides that he's going to let out one of those Bigfoot whoops that you see on a TV show, Finding Bigfoot, since the show had just started and it was real popular. And we're at this one section where uh, it was a waterfall with a bridge, and there were people everywhere. So Jamie lets out this whoop, and all of a sudden, every little kid and every adult, all around, all you hear is whoops everywhere, all through this whole tour section. I'm just laughing hysterically. I I thought it was the greatest thing ever. So we finish hiking all day, and we're tired, and we head back to our cabin, and we get the bonfire going, and we just got something to eat, and we just cracked open our first adult beverage. And Jamie goes, well, hey, since we're here, we can hike up into the mountains right from here, and we go looking for Bigfoot. I'm like, we've been out you know, hiking all day. I mean, I'm, I'm an old man at this point. I'm like 45, 46 years old, and you know, a little bit out of shape. I'm like, I'm just tired. I would have rested dogs and two other of those with. And they're like, you know, can't we just sit here? And Jamie and his wife kept on going, oh, come on. We're never going to have this chance again. And if you finally get to that point where it's like, you know, if we do it, then he'll be quiet. And we'll say we've done it. We can come back and we can drink a beer. So we all gather up and get ready to go. And we're so unprepared. We have a Apple iPod with us, one voice recorder, one flashlight. And I had a buck knife with me. I had my flip phone because it was about that long ago. And you know, the service out there said so the cell phone really wasn't going to do any good. But We decide we're going to hike out there to this mountain. And this little beagle we call Baby is coming with us. In order to get there, you have to hike through this, like, pine tree farm. So we hike through the pine tree farm. We're going up the side of this mountain. And you get to the top, and there's still a roadway left there from where they put a high-tension power line in. And we get up there to that power line, and it was unbelievable. Every one of us sat there with our mouths hanging open, catching flies and gnats in our mouths. 
it looked like the whole forest was set up for Christmas. There were millions of lightning bugs everywhere you looked. Everything had a lightning bug on it, and they were all twinkling. It looked like a Christmas display. Naturally, because of you know technology back in the day, you know the cell phone, you know flip phone didn't catch a good picture, and nothing we had would catch a good picture. So we just put that in our memory banks. And Todd, you know, other guy, and myself, we looked at Jamie and said, "Okay, let's see what you got. Do one of your your tree knocks and see if we get anything back." So Jamie does a tree knock, and nothing happens. So then he does a whoop. Nothing happens. So like, okay, we'll follow since you know we got this road here. It's not so bad hiking. We'll follow the road down for a while, and then we'll try to get a little further into the mountains. So we end up stopping this one spot, and we're looking, and we have a swamp in front of us, and then behind us, off to you know, you go from the swamp to the road, and then off to the road, there's a little like five foot section, and then goes down a thirty foot drop off. So I'm like, okay, go ahead, try the tree knock again. You know, at this point, we're ready for. Let's do the tree knock and go back to the campfire and rest and get something to drink. So he does the tree knock. And we get a tree knock back. Todd and I look at each other and we look at him and say, that is a million different things it could be. The wind could have blew two trees together. A buck could be going through there and hit an antler. A branch might have, a squirrel might have been walking on a branch and it fell and hit another branch. I said, not sold, it's Bigfoot. We said, try two knocks. So he does two knocks. And almost instantly, we get two knocks back. Now, I'm not one to believe in coincidences, so this really has my interest peaked. And I'm really starting to scan into the swamp area, and we can hear something shuffling and moving around in the swamp. I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me because I could see back in the swamp ways, about, probably about 100 feet or so, there's a tree, and then this, this, it looks like this big guy, it looks like a linebacker that keeps peeking out to the right of the tree. And looking at us and then going back. Wait a while and then peek out and then go back. So someone goes, well, go ahead and do one of those Bigfoot whoops. So he does the Bigfoot whoop. And we get a whoop back. So now I am just totally flabbergasted. It's like I'm thinking back. You know, I've hunted these in the woods for 30 plus years. And I have never seen anything do a tree knock. I've never heard an animal make a noise like that. And I'm trying to figure out what animal makes this noise. So now everyone's starting to get into it. You know, Monique and Jennifer, they're all making tree knocks and they're all doing whoops and we're getting tree knocks and whoops back and they're getting louder. And the shuffling we're hearing in the weeds is getting louder. So we're figuring it's getting closer. So we're like, okay, well, maybe we got to get the dog and get out of here. And we looked around. The dog is long gone. We don't know what happened to the dog. It disappeared on us. So now they're doing them, you know, and like I said, most people have this encounter with a Bigfoot. That lasts, you know, five seconds, and it's done, and it's gone. This was not five seconds. I mean, this was going on and on and on. And we're trying to, you know, scan, and I'm, I'm still seeing the, sh the shadow occasion. When I look at the right spot, I'd see a shadow peek out, and then they hide back down. And I could see it, like, crouch down, and, you know, hear the noise go through the weeds. So it, was, it would get down on all fours, and, and I used the bush to go from tree to tree. So as we're sitting there doing it, the, Monique was getting ready to do this gorilla growl, and we heard a tree knock from behind us. And they're like, oh, it got by us. Now it's on its way out. And I'm like, no, there is no way, no way that this thing got all the way through the swamp, up onto the road, across the road, and down this 30-foot drop off and on its way out without us seeing it or hearing it do it. No way. I, I don't care if it's a ninja. It's not going to happen. So as we're talking about you know, that being the same one or not the same one, we get the tree knocked back from where we were originally getting them from. So then we come to the realization now that we're in the middle of two of them that are communicating back and forth, and we're stuck in the middle. So now they're doing whoops, and they're coming, whoops are coming from back and forth. And we're just sitting in the middle, like we're watching a tennis game where it's just going back and forth, back and forth. So it got quiet for a couple sections. And then Monique, who has a really strong voice because she's a singer and it's a, in a rock band, she decides she's going to do this like, oof, 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 oof really angry gorilla growl and so she lets this thing out and then everything stops and all of a sudden you just hear this noise this cracking crunching noise and i look into the swamp in time to see this tree well the tree is no longer standing it is flying through the air towards us and the tree lands and it's so close to me you can hear it it hits and i hear the concussion i feel the concussion in my chest and i'm excited now because i'm going 
It's making its break. It's going to make run through it past us. I'm going to see this thing clear now. And then I hear Todd, the big tough guy standing beside me. He goes, I'm out of here. And I look and the four of them are running up the side of the mountain, leaving me behind. And all of a sudden my bravery decided, uh, yeah, you're not that brave after all. And I started taking off running after him. And unbeknownst to all of us was Monique had carried with her one of those air horns. All of a sudden, as we're trying to run out of there, like the Scooby-Doo gang up the side of the hill, Monique lets off this air horn, air blast. And all of a sudden, we'll fall into the ground, grabbing our hearts because that scared us more than anything else. So it's like we're all gasping for airs and we're screaming at Monique for giving us a warning. And it was like gathered our composure. And Jenny, the uh, Jamie's wife, is sitting there going, all right, everyone, let's be careful. No one fall down. We got to get out of here. So we set up in the single file line. And since I was the only one with a weapon, you know, a big four inch buck knife, they led the way with the flashlight and I followed behind them. And as we're walking through, you know, again, now we got a good mile, mile and a half hike back to get to the cabin. We're not prepared at all. We don't have flashlights. There, there's nothing really there for us. And it's where we're walking. We're under the trees. So the moon's not even going to be help light us up at all. And every, we keep hearing like twigs break. We're hearing snapping coming from behind us from our left side and from our right side. And we're like, now our adrenaline's flowing and the shock is sinking in. Every noise we hear is that Bigfoot's coming, Bigfoot's coming, Bigfoot's coming. So we make it all the way through. We get back to the campfire and sit by the fire is the beagle. It's like, okay, you knew it was going to happen, buddy. Instead of you telling us or warning us, you just came back here and sat and waiting for us to come. And the dog's just sitting there jumping in on all of us. And we're talking about what happened. We're all, all put up something to drink. And we, we're so nervous and so keyed up, we can't drink anything. I mean, it's just like, and again, the more noise that we hear in the woods, the more that we're thinking, it's that thing. It followed us. Whatever just threw that tree at us, it's right there. It's waiting to come out at, come at us. We're not seeing it, but we can hear it. And finally, we decide, okay, that's it. We're going to go in the cabin. We'll lock the doors. We'll go out in the morning in the daylight and we can see and check what's happening. Well, here's the kicker. We get to the cabin. Monique and Todd and Jamie and Jenny all have bedrooms up on the second floor that have a door that you lock to get in and out of. Where I was sleeping was down on the, the basement level, the ground floor level, which looked out to the woods that we just came running out of through a sliding glass door only. And I'm like, yeah, I just know I'm going to roll over and I'm going to look out that sliding glass door and Bigfoot's going to be standing there just staring right at me. So needless to say, I didn't get much sleep that night. We did go out the next morning and we, we hiked up to where we were at and we found some partial footprints in the swampy area where it wasn't too bad where we could still see a little bit through the mud without the muck. And we measured them about 19 inches long and about eight and a half inches wide. And we found the tree and the three of us, me, Jamie, and Todd, tried to move the tree and we couldn't budge this tree. But the night before, it had came flying through the air at us. And that sort of right then made me a believer in Bigfoot and set me on a path where all of a sudden now, I have to find out. I want to see. I want to get a good sighting. I want to get a good picture. I ain't out trying to prove to nobody else because you don't believe, you're not going to believe unless you have your own encounter. But I want to just put my mind at ease. I want to get a good picture of it and go from there. After that experience happened, myself and Jamie, we started our own little group where we start going out and we'd investigate Bigfoot sightings or dogman sightings or you know, anything else. And we'd already did ghosts in that. So we were, you know, trying to encompass the whole thing. Well, he called me, it was about three years afterwards and said that he got a, a Bigfoot sighting out in an area that was close to us. And he wanted to meet me out there so we can investigate the area. And this was like end of February, beginning of March. So there's still, you know, it snowed a little bit, but some of it had melted off. So there's pot patches of snow on the ground. And as I'm heading out there to meet him, I'm going on the main road to get there. It's 55. But I'm doing like 35 because it's a back road. There ain't much traffic. And I'm trying to keep my eyes open for the snow in the field to see if I can see any footprints or anything in the snow. Well, as I'm coming to the one area where there's a little creek that runs through a wooded area that goes back, I look and I go, well, that's a weird looking tree. I'm looking and go, wait a minute. And here's this tree that was about seven and a half foot tall that had a, a pointed like head on it with a white mohawk coming down the back of it. And it had these great big shoulders in the back. It was walking through the stream so it wouldn't leave any footprints. And it had two white patches, like streaks, going down its back and its shoulders. And it's just walking along 
the stream. And I'm like, I'm getting a picture. So I stop my car. I grab my phone. I'm going to go take a picture. And the car behind me honks the horn. And as soon as it does that, this thing takes off into the, into the woods, running along the stream. And I knew the area was gone. I knew if I drove down further, there's about a mile and a half down the road, there's a turn to the left. I could take that old dirt road to the left and then make another left and come back to where I was. And then this way, I would hopefully cut the thing off again. I would see it coming towards me. So I'm doing my best Dukes of Hazard impersonation, trying to fly down as fast as I can and make these turns and get there. And just as I get to the point where I'm at the other side, out pop six deer running full speed ahead. They come flying out of the woods, jump across the road, and just take off like you know, like I was chasing them or something. And I slammed on the brakes. I jumped out of the car, and I sat there and waited and listened. And I never never came through it must have seen me coming in the car and decided that it was going to uh like sit down and wait me out so i went back and met up with jamie and we looked around but because it was walking in the creek we couldn't find any any footprints or any signs it was there now this last one i want to tell you about this happened to me this february we had just got our last major snow slash ice storm this winter was really weird because we'd get ice more than we'd get snow I decided I was going to go out hiking in the woods. I just needed to get out of the house. It was like 30 degrees out. And I went to this area that I usually had, you know, good luck finding footprints. I'm walking through and there's a spot that you have to walk over to get across the stream. And naturally I make it all but one foot. So my right foot falls in the stream. I get soaked up to my knee. So I keep on going. And as I'm walking, I'm looking, going, wait a minute. I'm sitting on ice and I'm 320 pounds, 350 pounds. I'm wearing a 50-pound backpack. I'm not breaking the ice, but there's a footprint coming towards me that went right through the ice. So I'm like, I got to get down there and see if I can make this look right, get a good picture of it, or maybe find anything, figure out if it's just a weird break in the ice or what's going on. So I'm going on my hands and knees on the middle of this frozen little pond, and I'm looking at this footprint, and all of a sudden I hear, off to my left, a tree knock. And I stop, and I'm looking around. And I go, ah, I didn't just hear that. So I'm waiting, waiting, and all of a sudden I hear another tree knock off the same area. And I'm like, okay, there's nothing seeing me because where I'm down on my hands and knees behind the shrubs and everything, whatever's doing a tree knock can't see me where I'm at. So I turn to face the direction where I'm in the tree knocks, and I stand up, and then I hear another tree knock coming from the right side now. So I'm like, okay. Something told me, said, take a look from the right to the left and see if you could see anything. So I start gradually looking around, looking around, and there I could see there's two goose hunters in their blaze orange with the shotguns walking from the left heading to the right. And I'm like, okay, let me just sit here, not say anything, and, and just watch out and let's see what happens. Just, nobody knows I'm here. I'm hidden. So the goose hunters get down and they get to the part where you can walk back to the trail to your cars. All of a sudden, from the right-hand side, tree knock. And then all of a sudden, back to the left side, I hear tree knock. I'm sitting thinking, they were telling each other that these guys were coming, and they were communicating back and forth with this tree knock. I said, I'm going to head up to see what they do when they see me. So naturally, I go walk up there, have to cross another stream, make it all the way through except the last footstep again. Now my other leg falls into the stream up to my knee. So I am like frozen from my feet, my knees down. It's just like chattering ice. And I finally crawl up there, and I get on top of these railroad tracks, and I'm like, I'm frozen. I'm going to follow the railroad tracks to the shortcut that takes the trail, get home, and get warmed up because I am froze. So I'm walking along these trails. This, I'm just shaking my head because I'm so cold. And then I realize what I'm looking at on the, the snow from the, the tra- between the tracks in front of me are bare footprints. And I'm looking and going, what? And I drop down and take a look. There are three different size footprints in the snow. There's a 19-inch footprint that was a little bit over nine inches wide. There was a 16-inch footprint that was about eight and a quarter inches wide. And then there was a 12-inch footprint that was about six inches wide. And they're walking side by side down these railroad tracks. And they're so side by side that occasionally they're stepping on each other's tracks. And so you couldn't get a lot of you know good pictures, or a lot of good information on all the tracks. But enough to follow them. And I'm following these truck footprints down these railroad tracks until they come to the area where the hunters all come out of. And then they jump off the tracks and they go down into the, the swampy woody area. And I can't fall them in the swampy woody area anymore. So it's like, I just thought that was really neat that I was sitting there off to the side. And I was able to watch them communicate back and forth about a danger with the two hunters 
But then with me, they didn't pay me a bit of difference whatsoever. But then again, you know, I wasn't armed except for with the camera. Maybe that didn't scare them so much. My Bigfoot sighting happened in Avery County, North Carolina. It was late fall in 2007. I was a closing manager at a local pizzeria in the town of Newland. It was about 11.30. And to make my trip short, instead of taking the usual route home, I went down a, say, four-mile-long dirt road. It followed Estato River. We called it Tow River Road. I was halfway. There's this big, steep curve, and I saw what I thought was a bear coming off of the bank on its hind legs. And I thought to myself, a bear is not going to walk down a bank that steep on its hind legs. As I got closer, I was I was in a 90 Ford pickup truck, four-wheel drive. And as I got closer to this, what I thought was a bear, I realized it's not a bear. It was about 10, maybe 10 and a half feet tall, long, groomed hair. And as I pulled up beside of it, I looked through the passenger window of my truck. And through the window, what I seen was from navel to nipple, a perfect specimen of a ripped man with hair. And as I went on past, I looked back in my rearview mirror to watch this thing turn completely. The entire body turned and looked and followed me where I was going and slowly began running after me. I changed the gears, dropped the gear to speed up. I was doing about 35 and it was gaining on me. I gave it some more gas and speed it up and I hit about 50 on a road you shouldn't be doing more than 25 miles an hour on. And this incredible Hulk with hair was still gaining. And I just pushed it to the floor and got out of there. And like I said, this thing was a perfect specimen. It looked like a bodybuilder. It was totally ripped, maybe three inch hair from head to toe, but not on the face and very little on the torso. No hair on the palms. But like I said, it was gaining on me and I was doing almost 40 miles an hour. I was only like a mile from my home. And as I ran the curb to get to my house, I started hitting the horn. So my wife would open the door because I wasn't stopping. I wasn't getting my keys out. I was going to crash through the door if possible. This thing terrified me. And I only seen it for 10 seconds, 15. But I knew what it was the moment I pulled up the side of it. And it was like three days later like maybe a mile and a half away, someone else had seen this thing walk past their kitchen window. Their kitchen window was nine feet off the ground, but they seen this head and shoulders go past and begin to eat the chickens out of their chicken coop. I no longer live in the mountains, but even as a child growing up in the mountains, I'd be out playing, I would hear whistles and grunts, wood knocks, and I've always believed it. People told me I was crazy. My story's not long, but it is what it is. And that's the extent of my story. And it took me a good 20 minutes to tell my wife what had happened. And I do believe this is all of my story. It's short but sweet. My Bigfoot sighting took place in the summer of 2020. To be more specific, it was July 26, 2020. And I remember the date because it was a date that 100% changed my life forever and my view on the cryptid being that so many people love, which is known as Bigfoot, Sasquatch. It was about 9.30 to 10 o'clock at night. My stepmother just got home. I was living at my father's house at that time. I had just recently moved back from the state of Hawaii. And my father and I were just conversating on the couch, just joking around, having a good time. And my stepmother finally got home from getting all the groceries. So we went out there to help her. We went out and I noticed a set of eye shine kind of out in the distance. Now, my father, he has 11 acres on his property and it is all but from the backyard wooded. So from the back porch to the fence line where the woods start is only about probably 30 to 35 feet. So it's not that far away. 
And I noticed that when we first went out there and we grabbed the first little bit of groceries, some eye shine. I didn't think anything of it though. You know, it's the woods. My father has plenty of deer that stay on the property. So I just associated with that and just kept moving on. It wasn't until my father noticed it as well. And then he brought up the idea of, okay, that's not a deer because look at where it would be on the property. And I had to think of the property myself in my head to make sure that I was on the same page he was. And once I started thinking about it, I realized that my father brought up a good point. Now, in our property, there's one sole lone tree near the front part of the backyard. And it stands in total height of about 20 feet. But the lowest branch on it is only nine feet off the ground. And the set of eyes were directly under that branch, probably maybe only separated by six to eight inches, give or take. And that was odd for he and I because deer obviously don't get that tall. Trying to rationalize what we were seeing, I just said it as, okay, it's probably a mountain lion or a bobcat. We get some of those here in East Tennessee. I'm not going to be too concerned about it. You know, I'll let it go with separate rays. It's more scared of me than I am of it. Finished grabbing the groceries, went back inside, came back out to grab the last bit of it. And then that's when my father started looking at it. Now, my father never brought the groceries that he grabbed back inside. They were sitting beside him. So I grabbed those, brought them back inside, and then went back out there to talk to him. And I asked him, I said, everything okay? And he said, I don't know. Something doesn't feel right. And I said, what do you mean? He says, I don't know. Something just doesn't feel right. And I asked him, I said, well, what is it that you're feeling? He says, I just feel this weird sensation. And I said, well, can you describe it? And he said, it just feels like something kind of just hit me, like a low humming sound. I said, so like infrasound. He said, yeah, I guess you could say that is. Now I'm in the army and I know a little bit about infrasound. I know a little bit about how sound can affect people. We've used it in the army a few times. So I kind of knew what he was going through. I kind of knew what he was experiencing so I could relate to him. I personally didn't feel it, but I could tell that whatever it was that he was feeling deeply disturbed him. So he said, just stay here, keep your eyes on it. We'll try to rationalize this out. I said, okay, no problem. So he went inside to compose himself and I just stayed out there looking at the eye shine. Still thinking it's a bobcat or a bear that's climbed a tree and it's just looking at us. Maybe dad is just feeling sick. That's what I was relating it to. I knew the idea of Bigfoot, but I wasn't a big believer in it. You know, I always thought that maybe it could have been misidentification of bear or sometimes when my father hunts, he wears a ghillie suit. So, you know, it always could have been an idea of well, maybe somebody in a ghillie suit, somebody misidentified it, you know, for a Sasquatch. But needless to say, at that point in time, I didn't know that I was staring at a Bigfoot until moments later. My father came back outside with a flashlight. And when he went to shine it over there, the creature, the Bigfoot, took a step back and kind of went beside this tree to get away from the light. Now, just a little bit of light still hit it. So all we could see was a little bit of fur, not enough to really know what it is, but we could tell that it was behind the tree at this point. So my father, being the outdoor man that he is, you know, we both own several different weapons. He went out and grabbed his 357 Magnum. And he said, I'm going to shoot once close by to it just to scare it away. I'm not going to actually shoot it. I said, okay, because, you know, there's a hunter code. If you don't know what it is, don't shoot it. Especially when it's out of season, we don't have tags for the animal that it is. We can get in a lot of trouble. Tennessee Fish and Wildlife take that very seriously. And if it's a mountain lion, it's even worse because it's illegal to kill a mountain lion in the state of Tennessee. So he just shot by it. And when he shot by it, it went from that tree to the very far edge of the tree line in about three seconds. And that's about a hundred foot gap. And it launched itself over there in about three seconds. I've never seen anything in my life move that fast. And that's what kind of took me back at first. I was like, wow, you know, bears don't move that fast. Mountain lions can move pretty fast, but I've never seen one move that fast. So I really don't know what that is. And dad noticed that it still was looking at us at this point. You can still see the eye shine. Now, granted, it was kind of thick in the trees, thick in the wilderness, but you could still notice it. And the woods were awfully quiet. So we knew that it was some kind of big animal or predator nonetheless. So my father fired another shot by it. And it was at that time when it ran away, you could really hear and feel the size of it when it ran away, crashing through the brush and everything. It was insane. And my father was visibly shaken. My family and all of us, we grew up in West Virginia, moved to Tennessee when I was real young. But my father has always hunted his whole life. I've hunted my whole life. Both of us have never experienced anything like that at all. 
we go back inside we start talking about it he says i maybe it was just a big bear or something you know just more you know curiosity in a sense killed a cat and i always asked him i said well did you think that shooting at it was the right plan could we have approached it differently both of us grabbed flashlights try to get better views of it better angles of it to see what it is but my father, he said, no. He said, I just want it scared to get away from the property because of your sisters. I have three younger sisters, and they're not scared of anything at all. So they 100% would have just seen it as a cute, fluffy animal and wanted to play with it. Going forward from there, it was probably about 10.45, almost 11 o'clock. And I went back outside to throw some wood in the wood stove for the night so we could be a little bit more. Now, I know it's July. But my father keeps a wood stone running all year long because he's on blood thinners. So he's constantly always cold. So I throw some wood in the wood stove just to keep the temperature up in the house a little bit. And that's when I noticed the eyes were back in the same spot as when I first noticed them under the same tree branch. And that's when I said, OK, this obviously isn't an animal that is scared of us or it wouldn't come back to the same spot. So that's when I ran inside, told dad, hey, it's back. It's in the same spot that it was originally in. My father grabbed his hunting rifle and I grabbed mine. At that point, we went outside because we were under the impression that this animal is dangerous. It shows a threat to not only us, but our family as well for not being scared of us. We've, he's, like I said, my father saw this animal twice now and it was back in the same spot that it was in. My father said, OK, before shooting at it, I'm just going to yell at it. You know, ammo is expensive. I don't feel like wasting a lot of that. It's understandable. When he yelled. It proceeded to yell back. Now, my father, he just went, you know, hey, hey, get on and just get, go away. And it didn't repeat the exact phrase back, obviously, but it said, and then it made an intelligible sound that was similar to it. It just went like, oh, and that shook me to the core because I've never heard an animal make that noise before. And I can notice on my dad's face, he went white as a ghost. He didn't know where he was. He could have been for lack of a better term, looking at a ghost or just seeing one. He was scared. I finally looked at that and I said, I said, we have to do something. I was like, because I don't know what that is. He says, I don't know what it is either. And so me not wanting to shoot an unknown animal that I don't know what it is, that could very well be a human on our property trespassing and just snooping around. I throw something at it. There was a brick that was right on our porch. My father has several bricks around uh, we were re-bricking up the smokehouse that we have. So we had some spare bricks laying on the porch. So I grabbed one of those spare bricks and I just threw it in that general direction. And the bricks are somewhat heavy, so I didn't, you know, get it very far. But I got it far enough to where, you know, it would notice that I was throwing it at it. When I threw that, it started, you know, going up, back up the hill, going away. You could still, you know, hear it brushing through the wood lines and everything. Later that same night, at about one or two, I can't remember the exact time. It was in between one to two o'clock. I do remember that much. I apologize for not knowing the exact time. It was all quiet. I was still awake, still trying to think. I was up all night trying to think of what we were seeing. So was my father. Everybody else was asleep. It was at that point where we started hearing a whoop-like sound. Now, at this point, I didn't know anything about the Sierra sounds. But if you do know the Sierra sounds or don't know them, I highly suggest looking them up. There's part of the Sierra sounds where there's a whooping sound in it. It's like whoop, whoop, whoop. We heard a sound very similar to that at that time of the night. And so we know that there's whooping cranes. They're not very popular around eastern Tennessee. I think I've only seen maybe one around here. But we knew that wasn't the case. I wasn't going to associate with a whooping crane, you know, especially in the middle of the night. You wouldn't hear that. An owl, maybe. But knowing what I know now, I know that it wasn't an owl. I know that it indeed was the Bigfoot. We don't go back outside. We just say, OK, we'll wait for it in the morning. We'll go out in the morning. We'll try to see if there's any signs of wave what have been there, you know, scat or anything like that. We'll go out. We'll look for signs. And then we'll assess from there. The morning comes, we eat breakfast. We grab our hunting rifles. We go in the four wheelers. We go out to where that tree is. We notice that the ground around it is smashed down. There's sadly no footprints, but it was smashed down around it. And you can see where it will walk to the tree line. All the bushes were smashed down as well. It was a big animal that was there. We then decided, okay, well, we're going to go up over the hill that's in the backyard that leads to the rest of the property. So when we get up over that hill, we noticed that the tripod stand that my father and I put up a week earlier had just been destroyed. It was knocked over. It was, you know, the top part of it was ripped to shreds. The fence line beside it was electric and barbed wire fence. We never like put the electric part on because of the girls, but the barbed wire part was still there. 
but the fence itself was pushed down and ripped as if something grabbed it, pushed it down to step over it, and then just broke it. I've never seen anything like that in my life. And it was at this point where we put the tripod stand back up, try to figure out what happened. We're still thinking, okay, I better knock it over. Maybe one of us left food up there by accident or something, and it was trying to get to the food. You know, we're just trying to rationally process what we're seeing. We set up the tripod tent. We go up on it. Well, I go up on it. My father stays below. It's not until I talk to my father saying, do you see anything down there? I mean, I don't see any signs of anything else up here. And he wouldn't answer me. And that's when I look back and his hand was pointing in front of him and shaking. And he said, it's behind the tree. I said, what do you mean? He's just quietly, he said, it's behind the tree. Something big and black is behind the tree. And that's when I look and then that's when I saw it for the first time. It was hiding behind a tree. Most of its body, about three quarters of its body was behind the tree. And its head would be leaning out from the side of the tree, looking at us, and then going back behind a tree, leaning back out and going back in. Kind of like if you're playing peekaboo behind a tree, in a sense, to give you a better description of what I was seeing. Now, to describe the creature itself, if you've never seen a Bigfoot or if this is your first time hearing about it, it's about nine feet tall, covered in hair, insanely muscular. I would say probably anywhere between eight to 900 pounds. Just broad shoulder, you can see the muscle definition under the the hair. You can see its face. It had a very human-like face. And I think that's what caught me off guard the most, was just how human-like this animal was. And we sit there and we stare at it for what felt like eternity, but in reality, it was probably only 15 to 20 seconds, which is still, from what I've seen from other sightings, a decent sighting in terms of length. It wasn't until my dad said, okay, I'm going to go behind you down the slope a little bit, see if I get a better angle. And once he moved behind me, it moved out from behind the tree and walked on two feet like it was just a regular human. Just walked arm swinging and everything. And it went into the thick of the woods. And just as soon as I saw it, it was gone in an instant. I was shaken to my core. I was nervous. I was scared. I don't know what to think about it. My father and I were like, okay, let's go back to the house. And, you know, we're, we're not going to explain this to the girls or my stepmother or anything. We're just going to just go back and we're just going to just say it's no big deal. It was a bear because we didn't even want to believe what we saw at that point. We go back to the house. Nothing else happens for that day. We just stay in the house the whole day. The next day comes after that. It's about 630 in the morning. I'm up and I'm getting ready to go to work. I got my PT uniform on and everything. The Army National Guard. I'm getting ready to go do conduct PT. When I go out towards my truck, I hear the same whooping sounds I heard a few nights previous. At the same pitch, the same, almost sound like it was from the same distance. So I knew right then and there, okay, what we saw actually happened. It wasn't a figment of my imagination. I didn't dream it. There's a Sasquatch in our backyard. When I got back from work that day and everything, father got back from work that day. We both decided, okay, we're going to go out and look for it one more time just to see if it's still out there. And if we can, maybe we can get a picture of it or see if we can get it on film with a, ca- a trail camera or anything. Hindsight's 2020, I should have taken my phone out and gotten a picture or filmed it when we saw it that day. But I was so in awe and in shock that never crossed my mind to do that. When you're face to face with an urban legend that you grew up knowing about, you know, you know, watching Monster Quest and all these you know, shows that talk about Bigfoot. And you're actually seeing one in the flesh in front of your eyes. You're taking it back from it. You're just amazed. This thing actually is it's real. And that's why I didn't pull out my phone or anything like that. I was just in awe at the sheer size and just overall presence you could feel from it being in your presence. So that's why I never got the picture of it. And to this day, that still bothers me that I should have done that. We didn't get any other action since then at my dad's property. I've not heard any whoops since I've been over there. Every time I go over there to visit him, I still go back there and look around. Maybe one day I'll find tracks or I'll find evidence of it maybe coming back. But it's been over two years now. We've not seen anything else from it. But maybe one day that'll change. You know, you got to stay optimistic with it. From what I've seen and heard, squashing ain't easy. You know, you're going to lose more than you win. Now, going off from that, obviously when that happened, I became a believer 100%. You know, I've seen it in the flesh. I know it's real now. I started to open up more with my family about it, trying to you know, ask them, have you seen anything like this before or had any kind of weird encounters or here were strangers in the night or anything? Of course, you know, none of them said yes. You know, I was just like, no, nah, you just saw a bear or something or your mom was playing a trick on you. You know, you didn't actually see that. 
the only people that believe what happened is my father and I. It wasn't until when I joined the army, I heard more stories about this. And most of it came from stationed over in Washington and California. The two stories I will tell now is from both of those states. Two of my sergeants told me these stories. Uh, one each, each sergeant respectively had their own encounter. The one that was stationed up in Washington, they were just doing a simple, you know, patrol. They went around base, just patrolling the base and everything. They're, they're MPs, which stands for military police. They're just patrolling around the base, making sure everything's fine. You know, in every military base, there's, there's forests. You know, there's wood lines for training purposes and everything. And also, in case with this base, they keep some wildlife there because it's illegal for them to touch and destroy the environment that that said wildlife is in. So they have to leave it on base. Well, when they went on patrol, he noticed something walk across the street way up in the distance, just enough to where the headlights could barely pick it up and go in the woods. And they stopped, got out, grabbed spotlights, looked around. Didn't see nothing in the woods at all. But he knew that no one is supposed to be out at this time. No one is supposed to be in this part of the base at this time. And it was too big to be anybody that was there at that time. And from what he told me, he said that from the brief view that he saw of it crossing the street, he could tell it was big and it had a stride. It cleared two lanes in about two seconds. That's pretty impressive and pretty fast. You know, the average human can't even do that. The second encounter from my other sergeant, he was down performing NTC. NTC is a training exercise that we have to do for the Army. It's one month long. It's in Fort Irwin, California. It's always in the summer. It's always hot. It's always miserable. But that's just, you know, that's just how it is. But they were there, and he went off post. It was the last week they were there. They were able to go off post for a little bit. So they went off post, and they just went hiking. That was the thing that, you know, they, they can do. They said, hey, if you guys want to go off post, enjoy yourselves for a little bit. You just went through rigorous training for three straight weeks. We're going to give you a little relaxed time. Go for it. So they did. They left, they went for it, they went hiking. And his encounter is somewhat similar to mine, but also very different, given the fact that his was all during the day. He didn't have any encounters the night before or any after that, because they camped out there, you know, for two days. The next morning, you know, they went out there for one night. The next morning when they woke up, they packed up the tents and they were finishing up the hike before coming back to the vehicle to go back to post. He heard a yell. A deep guttural, well, when he described it to me, he said it, it sounded as if a heavy metal vocalist would scream and then gradually increase the pitch and then just stop at the height of the pitch. He said that he couldn't replicate it if he tried to. He said it was the weirdest thing ever that he's ever encountered. Later on that same day while they're hiking, he hears a big rock go into the stream by them. You know, here's a close sound of the rock falling into the stream. So obviously they look over and they notice a tall, hairy, humanoid figure in the water. Presumably what I would imagine is either fishing or maybe grabbing rocks or something like river rocks or something. But it was in the water on the bank. I apologize. Been over into the water, grabbing rocks or fish. You know, they can't tell what it was grabbing when he noticed that. He then was taken back, and one of his you know, battle buddies is what we call people that we hang out with in the army. We all call them battle buddies. Yelled, you know, he yelled out, you know, hey! And at that point, that creature stood up and bolted away from the river, up a hill, about forty-five degrees into a tree line, and was gone in a blink of an eye. And it took him forever to tell me this story, and it wasn't until he noticed whenever I was leaving. You know, the army one day had Bigfoot stickers. I said, yeah. So I got all kinds of Bigfoot stickers on the back of my truck. I said, I'm a, I'm a believer. I've had my own encounter. And he said, well, you won't believe this, but I have too. And when everybody else left the army, we were still there talking. And that's when he told me his story. And that goes for both of my sergeants. You know, both of them, they knew each other's stories. And they didn't want to tell anybody else until they figured out I had my own encounter. And then it just kind of became a thing between the three of us that we all knew that it's real. It's after we all have each had our own respectable encounter with it, but it's, it is hard to talk about. So I suggest if you have your own encounter, make it known. The more people that make it known for these encounters, the better the chances that we can prove that it exists because it is out there. And I truly believe working for the government that they know something about it 
and uh, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think they're just trying to preserve the species. I think they know if that they release information stating that it is a real object, they have proof of it. They have DNA. They have authenticated sightings. They're afraid, you know, big game hunters are going to want to come in there, add that to their trophies, you know, add that to the deer on the wall, you know, all, all kinds of other stuff like that. They're wanting to conserve the species. And I, for one, am okay with that. I don't know how long they've been here. Native Americans have tales from hundreds of years ago. So they've been here longer than anybody that's alive right now. So they've been here for a while. It could be almost safe to say they've been here longer than we have. So to preserve their species, I'm all for that, 100%. But I'm also for showing all the skeptics that they are real and that they're out there. I appreciate you guys listening to my story and listening to the stories that my fellow sergeants have told me. And if you have an encounter, please don't hesitate to say it. Well, that's it for tonight's show. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let us know. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. Seen a bunch of run-down new horse towns Where the church is the backbone, loves in the bow And the five-string melodies groove in With the farmland rows where the roots run deep Beyond the noise of the busy streets Where the songs of the south are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music yeah The sound of a memory brings me back To the bluegrass playing on my dad's a track His pick-up man had been through it Getting through the day on scrugs and skags Booking a bales to those Tennessee jams There's no other way that I'd do it When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out music yeah Summit on the backwards backwards and double time looking at the soul and the tremor of Kentucky star those are the anthems drumming now country boy living when I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo By. With the bass on the stereos booming When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah Some go going backwards, backwards and double time Looking at the soul and the tremolo Kentucky style Those are the anthems drumming out country boy living Best sweet tea, come and say.